Welcome to the Creative Pen Podcast. I'm Joanna Penn, thriller author and creative entrepreneur, bringing you interviews, inspiration and information on writing, publishing options and marketing ideas for your book. You can find the episode show notes, your free author blueprint and lots more information at thecreativepen.com and that's pen with a double N. And here's the show. Hello creatives, I'm Joanna Penn and this is episode 560 of the podcast and yes I got out but out of sync with my numbers <laughs> but I'm pretty sure this is 560 <laughs> and it is Saturday the 3rd of July 2021 as I record this. In today's show I'm talking to Jin Stevens about how she wrote her first self-published book Delay Don't Deny which shared her story of losing weight and more importantly gaining a lot of health benefits with intermittent fasting and how that then led to a traditional publishing deal and a huge community of people who find her books and information transformational including me. Uh, I've been intermittent fasting for almost a year now. And if you want more details of my story, I'll be on Jin's show, Intermittent Fasting Stories, in the next couple of weeks. We also talk about the pros and cons of self-publishing, the problems with relying on one platform, and why Jin quit Facebook to start a private membership group, which I know will resonate with many of you. And uh, quitting Facebook seems to be a thing at the moment. (laughs) So that is coming up in the interview section. In publishing news, there's a good interview on The Self-Publishing Show, episode 285, with Jane Friedman, who always has interesting things to say about the long-term view of publishing. She's been in it for a couple of decades now, I think, and uh, Jane notes that the subscription model is probably the main thing that traditional publishing is thinking about for audiobooks and ebooks, and also the direct-to-consumer model that might start to happen there, and in fact is happening there, as I reported a few weeks back when I went went on a conference and was like, oh, lots of traditional publishers are moving into direct sales for audio. So maybe they'll start to do that for other things. And this is important to retain revenue share, even as customers change their preferences. And this is something I've talked about too, the importance of selling direct as subscription models send digital basically to zero if you can get unlimited amounts of content for one price, which is what I do on Netflix, for example, then that's what people get used to. And we have to look at the shifting business models as things change. And uh, yeah, I'll come back to this in a minute, but I am planning on doing an in-between so rounding up a lot of these things in the next few weeks. So um, then also kind of publishing, kind of personal, my 2021 book sales revenue breakdown report. So I break down money, not total books sold because that's a really difficult number. (laughs) So I concentrate on the money. Uh, That is now out on my blog, links in the show notes. Now, I didn't do one of these last year in 2020 because, well, pandemic. (laughs) Last, uh, so my tax year runs May to April um, in the year. So after everything, and then you have to kind of wait until the results come in for the April. Uh, So that's sort of May, June. That's why it's coming out now. So this time last year, we were all in the depths of fear of the pandemic. And the last thing I wanted to do was kind of even consider what was going on with my book sales. And I really only do one of these once, like once a year or once every two years. (laughs) I monitor my cash flow almost every single day, but I don't look at this type of information. I've basically broken it down by platform, format, country, fiction, nonfiction, uh, brand, all of that type of thing. So you and what I've done is I've put the screenshot from 2019 of the pie chart or whatever, and then the screenshot from 2021. So you can see the difference. So just as uh, some of the highlights, I am still a six figure author, which is good from book sales alone. And uh, it was actually a better year than usual, (laughs) as has been reported in many places. The pandemic has driven more readers online and many indie authors benefited from having an established digital online business model. And uh, I'm particularly happy about growth in several of the wide platforms 
Find Away was 5% of my total revenue and direct sales through Payhip were 6% of my total revenue. Ingram Spark also 6%, which are all growth because uh, they were all, I think, less than 1% a couple of years ago. So I'm really happy about that. Total audiobook revenue is now at 21% of the total up from 15% in 2019. And actually, what's interesting is my ebook percentage has also grown. So audio is cannibalizing, if you can call it that, print of my total revenue, which is really interesting, even though my Ingram Spark has also grown. So that's interesting. My revenue by author name is remarkably similar, which again, I find fascinating because I feel sometimes that I make a lot more money from nonfiction, but it's not actually true. Uh, I mean, it's still more, but 57% nonfiction, 43% fiction. And the fiction, given that I only released one one novel last year. I did put out a box set too, the Matt Walker box set, but essentially most of that's backlist. But as as many times we've talked about, uh, the 2020 traditional publishing report was 67% backlist sales. And I'd say that's probably the same for most indie authors as well. So you can see more details of the breakdown on the blog post and also at my author timeline, thecreativepen.com forward slash timeline. And uh, that's got stuff going back to 2008 on, which is I kind of keep track of some of the major stuff that happens. And as a celebration of direct sales and also hopefully, fingers crossed, a celebration of the end of UK restrictions, which should be happening in July, I'm doing 50% off all my courses and audiobooks and ebooks, which you buy direct from me, for the month of July. You can go to thecreativepen.com forward slash learn for my courses and payhip.com forward slash thecreativepen for ebooks and audiobooks and use coupon. Coupon July 21, all caps July 21, at the checkout for 50% off. Links in the show notes. So you can um, go to the blog and find this. And uh, yeah, I hope that is helpful and another just another way to boost direct sales. And I've definitely been doing this. I did one of these last summer during the pandemic. And um, I say during the pandemic, we're still in a pandemic, but it feels very different to this time last year for sure. So there we go. I'm pretty excited that my uh, sort of my wide and direct sales are growing in many areas. So that is good. In my personal update, well, this week I have done very little writing, (laughs) but lots of reading and thinking and catching up with people. I went to London for a few days and as ever, you can see my pictures on Instagram at jfpenauthor. Visited some museums, did some long walks. It was so funny. I was literally like walking around my old, I have a lot of routes that I used to walk in London, kind of looking at things and taking it all in. I went to the V&A, went to an epic Iran exhibition and the V&A has this cast gallery of all these famous sculptures sculptures and I was just eating it all up, sort of looking everywhere. I was quite overstimulating, but in a very good way. I absolutely loved it. It was very good to get into the city and it definitely felt more hopeful than the last time I was there. It it just it's starting to come back to life and there are yes, things are disappearing, have disappeared, but a lot more is growing. So I really f- just felt very good to be back. Thanks also to Sasha Black this week, fellow author and podcaster, Sasha Black, who recommended the Clifton Strengths Assessment. So if you know this, if you don't know this, this is one of these kind of personality things where you answer a load of questions and then it tells you about yourself. Now, I love this stuff. I know some people don't like boxes, (laughs) but I find these kind of insights. I have a, a second degree in psychology and I find this very interesting. So I I know I have talked about this, but I've been feeling quite unsure about my direction for a while. I feel that every decade there needs to be some reinvention and I'm full time a decade this year. Um, I also feel like there's a lot of voices in the author space, a lot more than they were when I started out. And I frequently wonder whether mine is needed and where I fit in this new ecosystem. But doing this strengths assessment really helped a lot. And uh, if you know it, uh, if you don't know it, you can also Google it. But I'm, I'm, I am my top top five. It kind of comes out with these top five things that you should focus on, which are your strengths. So it's much more about looking at your strengths rather than your weaknesses. So my top five came out as learner, intellection, that is a word, (laughs) strategic, 
input and futuristic, which are all strategic thinking strengths. And that just made me feel a lot better. And it explains a lot about me. And it makes me feel better about my role here with you, which is essentially I consume a lot of books and podcasts and articles. And I'm always assessing things, trying to figure out what's going on and then reporting back to you in in the way that I do. And going away helped me think about all these things. And there have been a lot of, there's so much that I feel vibrating at the moment to all these different areas, what's happening with big tech and Jeff Bezos finishing up, which uh, as this goes out, he's pretty much done at Amazon and, uh, you know, positioning for the changes that are coming out of the pandemic. Because what's happening is we're moving into this kind of in-between phase where, yeah, there's still a pandemic, but we're moving more into, okay, vaccinations, living with it, moving on, moving out of the sort of emergency funding that's been going on into new ways of doing business. And so anyway, I'm going to do an in-between episode on this because I started writing about it and I've already got about eight pages. <laughs> so I will bring that back to you. But I had a lot of good thinking time. And I also wanted to mention, if you're interested in that strength stuff, Becca Syme over at Better Faster Academy. And Becca has her Quit series of books, um, uh, which are really good as well. Becca's going to come on the show in the next couple of months. And she's at Better Faster Academy. And talking of books, since we're on the topic, I want to recommend an excellent book, Undisruptable, A Mindset of Permanent Reinvention by Aidan McCullen. I have been reading this and I have pages of highlights and notes and thoughts and it. it's really feeding into what I've, I'm going to be talking about around what are some of the changes that we're going to have to navigate in the next few years. And as the ground shifts in many ways, personally, culturally, technologically, and our business model for authors, I'm thinking about this a lot. Um, so I wanted to recommend the book if you're interested, Undisruptible by Aidan McCullen. Um, because yeah, and it's not a technical book. It's got it's not like about AI or anything specific. It's more a mindset book. So yeah, I found that very useful about uh, jumping the S curve. So I'll be talking more about this. But yeah, very exciting. I love it when, you know, you're feeling like, oh, I'm just feeling all these things. And then you find a book that perfectly encapsulates exactly what you're feeling. <laughs> I love books. We love books. It's so funny if people, if like my friends or my family ask me about something, I'm like, ah, oh, well, here's, here's a book uh, that I recommend on the topic. <laughs> I really am that person who always has a book that is appropriate for that topic. I could be like a, one of those book doc, doctor people who recommend a book for a specific ailment, <laughs> mental ailment. Ah, anyway, getting off topic. So thanks for all your emails and tweets and comments. Rayanne sent a picture. She said, listening while doing some yard work, went to the market earlier, picked out a variety of lilies, lovely yellow and purple calla lilies. Beautiful. And uh, yes, always lovely to see your pictures. You can always tweet me at the creative pen. Uh, email me, Joanna, at the creative pen. Send me your pictures of where you are listening in the world. Linda says, uh, I value all your podcasts, but this one in particular will enrich my writing so much. You and Scott, uh, uh, that was Scott Dickers on humour, help me identify what's been missing. That one so essential, elusive element, humour. And um, Linda also said, P.S. You are funny, Joanna, in a wry, gentle way. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. I've quite a few of you have emailed me to say that. So that's good. <laughs> Oh, it's funny, isn't it? Because, of course, I mentioned that my brother is the funny one and we all have that family niche that we fulfil. And mine was always the ser serious, uh, very serious learning person, hard, hard working, hard studying, not the funny one. <laughs> uh, lots of comments, emails uh, on pseudo right. Probably 90% of the comments and emails are enthusiastic. Uh, for example, Jeff says, wow, this sounds and looks brilliant. Thanks for doing this interview. I'm always into the futurist shows. This one has something I can put to use right away. Um, new and better ways to describe things, people, emotions is always something I need so I don't sound the same all the time. And uh, Elizabeth said, I signed up today. I love these types of prompts. Oh, also, I love this from Elizabeth because she says, yes, yeah, so I signed up today. I love these types of prompts. I know myself quite well. No matter what the suggestion, I always end up putting it in my own terms, whether I want to or not. But that might be a function of age. The closer I get to 80, the more I express myself. So thank you, Elizabeth, for emailing me because so many people say, oh, all this like tech stuff, futurist stuff, AI stuff, it's only for young people. <laughs> 
<laughs> but it's all in your head because Elizabeth is getting close to 80 and she has jumped on the pseudo right beta. So there you go. Uh, love, love that. And uh, yeah, I mean, I'm not even a, an affiliate of pseudo right. You don't have to use it. Also, a few people said, oh, it doesn't seem very good for nonfiction. Well, that's because it's for fiction. There are plenty of tools for nonfiction. If you go to thecreativepen.com forward slash AI writing, uh, you will find my list of tools. There's tons and tons and tons now. But pseudo right is the one I've uh, the only one I found for fiction that I think is pretty cool. Oh, and in fact, Stella Hurst said, uh, I was lucky, got into the beta, blown away and spending way too much time playing. Yes, I think playing is the it's the fun part. I I really enjoy playing with it. Right. So today's show is sponsored by Drafter Digital and I'll play a word from the lovely Kevin Tomlinson in a minute. So I've been using Drafter Digital for many years now and for the first time I'm using their payment splitting to publish the relaxed author with Mark Leslie Lefebvre and it's very easy to do for collaborations which helps if you're doing a co if you're doing co-writing for a whole book like we're doing or an anthology where you're bundling together people's short stories that that type of thing. So uh, very, very good for those types of things. And you don't have to worry about paying people yourself. It all goes through draft to digital. So this type of corporate sponsorship pays for the hosting, transcription and editing. But my time and my brain, <laughs> my strategic brain is paid for by my patrons. And thank you, everybody who's been who have been supporting the show for years. Those of you who have continued to support during the, the pandemic, new patrons and uh, you're all amazing. So thanks to new patrons this week, Karen Dodd, Jerry Bridge, R- Richard Brady Williams, Ingrid KV Hardy and and Mike Hurd. And thanks to all the long-term supporters as well. You guys are fantastic. And you can support the show for just a few dollars or euros or GBP or Canadian dollars a month, less than a coffee a month. Although I'm also, uh, I've had a few of you say you don't want to do sort of every month, so you'd rather do a sort of one-off. And uh, so I'm, I'm setting up Buy Me A Coffee Uh, as well. I'm going to put that on the blog because, you know, some people do just say, look, that one episode gave me something and I'd just like to tip you or buy you a coffee. So I am setting that up at the moment. Right. So you can support the show at patreon.com, p-a-t-r-e-o-n.com forward slash the creative pen. Right. Here's a word from draft to digital and then we'll get into the interview. Hey, this is Kevin Tomlinson with draft to digital So if you've ever co-authored a book or tried to build a box set, you know the biggest pain is how to split up the royalties. That's why we at draft to digital have built D2D payment splitting. We've made it easy for you to share payments with other collaborators on your projects in whatever percentages you prefer. Right from the setup of your book, you can invite participants, agree on who gets paid what, and go. DDD takes care of all those pesky details like tax interviews and making sure everyone gets paid on time. And of course, you continue to own the rights to your work. So, get started on your collaborative project now at drafttodigital.com. We've made it easy for you. See you there. Jin Stevens is the New York Times bestselling author of Fast Feast Repeat, Delay Don't Deny, and Feast Without Fear. She's also a podcaster with three shows, including Intermittent Fasting Stories, which is one of my favorites. So welcome to the show, Jin. Oh, well, thank you for having me. And I'm so glad that's one of your favorites. I love oh, doing it. It is. I love to hear all the stories about everyone's different pathway. But today we're talking about you. Yay. So, yay. <laughs> it's, it's odd to be on this side of the microphone, right? <laughs> oh, yeah, absolutely. But I wanted to start with why did you decide to write a book in the first place? And how did you actually get through to the end? Because so many people say, oh, I'm going to write a book and never actually uh, you know, finish it. So how did you do that? And why did you decide to do it? You know, that's a very interesting question. I actually have had ideas for books as far back as I can remember. You know, I wrote as a child. I think every writer probably has stories like that. But, you know, getting published is so tricky, especially now. It's even harder than ever because just because you have something good to say doesn't mean that a publishing house is going to take a chance on you because unless you have a big audience, a big following, they're like, sorry, (laughs) I'm not interested. So, Really, all that has changed with the advent of self-publishing and the ability for anyone just to to get their message out there. But 
I, I didn't really know what would happen with self-publishing. I had a um, couple of Facebook groups that were, were really small, although they didn't feel small to me back at the time. It was 2016. And I was supporting people you know, who were doing intermittent fasting. We had probably... I don't know, right around three, actually at that time, before I wrote the book, I only had one Facebook group and we were probably right around 3000 members when I started writing Delay Don't Deny, my first book and the one that that I self-published first. And it all started because people would join the group and they would be like, how do I get started? Or my friends, the people that I knew, you know, I lost um, 80 pounds with intermittent fasting and have kept it off since 2015. And so people wanted to know what to do. What did I do? And so, you know, there weren't any books that I could send them to. Dr. Jason Fung had just released the obesity code in 2016, but he didn't really say, and here's what you do. It wasn't a plan for how to get started at the end. He had like a little bit of alternate daily fasting with like 36 hour fast, but I was like, not everybody wants to do 36 hour fasts. I prefer a daily eating window approach where I eat every day. I like to eat every day. And there were, were another several books that, that were good, but they missed some of the important information like fasting clean, which is something I realized over time was so very important. So I would tell people, well, you can read this book over here, but ignore what he says about drinking diet soda. Don't do that. And let me tell you why. So I was like, you know, I just really need a book that I can send people to and I'm going to write it myself and maybe nobody will buy it, <laughs> but I'm just going to put it up on Amazon. That was back in the days of create space. When, if you wanted to publish on Amazon, you did create space for the paperback and then you did KDP Kindle direct publishing for the electronic version. And then now they have since merged. So it's all through KDP now, but you know, I didn't know what I was doing. I did a lot of reading on the internet about how to format a book for publishing, things like gutters. I didn't know what that was, but it said that when they bind your book, <laughs> it doesn't look weird on the page. But I basically taught myself how to do it. You know, I'm a, I'm a teacher. I taught elementary school for 28 years and I have a doctorate in gifted education. I, I could figure things out. So that's just what I did. Writing it was the easy part for me. It really just flowed out of me. I write very much um, like I'm talking to you. And even though I included some research in Delay, Don't Deny, it's a pretty short book. And it, there are a links to a few studies and ideas here and there. But it's mostly, you know, like I'm giving my friend advice about how to start intermittent fasting. Mm. And that was really my goal was here's how you do it. Here's what you do just giving you the information that you need to get started and get and be successful. So it came out January, no, December 31st of 2016 really was the first day. So, but like January of 2017 is when it really hit the market. And I was so excited that first day, I think I sold like a hundred books because they, you know, <laughs> that's a lot for day one. You know, I just had my little group of 3000 people and I had started a second group because I knew I was writing the book and I intended it to be, you know, delayed on deny support group. So we had maybe 1500 members by that point in that group. And I remember mid-March of 2017, like I was selling an average of 18 copies a day. And I felt like, like just, you know, like I'd conquered the world. <laughs> oh yeah. No, that is, it's just a fantastic start. I want to come back on the writing process. Cause you said there that writing was the easy part and I can hear my audience. Like, oh, sorry, going, audience. Oh, oh my goodness. No, <laughs> I, I think that's because, so a couple of things. So one, you said you're, you writing as you're speaking, which I've read all your books. I know that's true. And that's fantastic. But it, I think one of the mistakes of many self-help books and health books is that there's not enough personal story. Right. And I was attracted to your book because let's face it, we're middle-aged women. Right. And I'm like, well, here's Dr. Jason Fung, some doctor guy, or Tim Ferriss talking about hardcore fasting. And here's Jin, who's this intelligent, educated, middle-aged woman. And I'm like, oh yeah, she's the story I feel like I uh, sort of get. And that, but that's so difficult. So how, how were you able to share things? Let, let's face it weight and your body image these are very personal things and for right. people listening how did you get over any fear of judgment or fear of of that kind of thing to actually write your personal story well i know that um thanks to facebook people had seen me people that i went to high school with and college they had seen my my pictures getting bigger and bigger over the years i weighed 210 pounds at my highest recorded that i saw on the scale could have been higher but i wasn't weighing much at that point they knew i was obese they could see it 
And so I'm what Malcolm Gladwell refers to in, in one of his books as a maven. I tell people things that I like. I always have. You know, I try to convince people, look what I'm doing. I love it. This is fabulous. Even before I had books, I, you know, that's why I started my first group. I'm like, I want a place where I can help my friends be successful with intermittent fasting. So I already had put it out there is, you know, there was nobody that didn't know that I had gained a lot of weight and then lost the weight. And I really was just like, I have these groups. I'm just being real. And, and authentic and telling the story of my struggles. So if I can tell the people that really know me, I can certainly tell strangers. Mm. Well, it's interesting because I think a lot of people don't do that. They write a self-help book or they write a health book and they don't put personal information in because they want to be like an expert uh, in inverted commas. So I also wanted to ask you about this because, as you said, you're a teacher for 28 years. You have a PhD, but you're not a medical doctor. And yet you've written books with medical research in them. So it, talk about your research process and how you learn about all these different things. Well, I'm a teacher and that's what teachers do. I can teach math without being a mathematician. I can teach history without being a historian. So I'm not afraid to find content and re-deliver it to people. That's literally what I was trained to do. In fact, one of my friends, my when I wrote Fast Feast Repeat, it had a lot more science in it because I wanted it to be everything that Delay Don't Deny wasn't. And I, I still love Delay Don't Deny, but it didn't have a deep dive. And so I wanted Fast Feast Repeat to have more scientific support. So as I was writing it, I know how to read the literature. You know, when you get a doctorate, you have to be able to read what's in the journals. I mean, my doctorate's gifted education, but still people write in wordy ways and you have to figure it all out in these, these journals, all these professional journals. And so I have to read, make sense of it and re-deliver it. So one of my friends was reading, you know, as I would finish a chapter, I'd be like, tell me what you think about this. Cause I didn't want it to be over people's heads. I wanted to strike that balance between a chat with Jen and giving you the science background that you want. And she said, I think every book should be written by a teacher. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, you know, that's really interesting to hear. I never really thought about that. But I, I really think that writing as a teacher is, is just a different perspective. Because again, it's just like teaching a lesson or delivering the content. If I want to teach a class of third graders about rocks and minerals, <laughs> I have to learn about rocks and minerals and then re-deliver it in a way that they understand it. So that's really what I'm doing just in the, the health and wellness world. You know, I'm writing a new book right now. Um, my deadline is May 7th, so it's coming up fast. But you do have to be a lot more careful with your sources. So it takes a lot longer. You know, when I said delay, don't deny was easy because I was lighter on the science. I and mean, I'm not saying I didn't have any, but as I'm writing now with a traditional publisher, I really want to make sure that I am supporting everything that I'm saying. And of course, writing a dissertation trained me to do that. <laughs> you don't make a statement like the sky is blue without finding support for that somewhere and having a footnote or an endnote or something. Yeah, I think that's really true. But it's interesting, as you said, I mean, this with a traditional publisher, you do have to be a lot more careful with your sources because uh, it, it's, I guess, more official in inverted commas right, in, right. in some way. And that they hopefully will have a fact checker as well who will help. Oh, you. they do. They yeah. do, which is so much fun because <laughs> when I was writing Fast Feast Repeat, I made a comment about the, the town where I went to college and they're like, actually, that's backwards. I'm like, oh, I always thought it was the other way, but it's nice just to have that. <laughs> <laughs> and just uh, so people know, you can actually hire people to do that for you if you want to um, self-publish books obviously you can you can hire uh, professional freelancers to, to check that but just coming back on the science and, and talking about fasting in particular because of course I found your book and I've been intermittent fasting since July last year 2020 and so I've learned a lot from you but I feel like a lot of people get it wrong so before we carry on with your publishing process maybe you could just give us the highlights of what your intermittent fasting fasting lifestyle is and how it's uh, about health as well as, as your weight management. Okay. I think the big differentiator for me versus really every book I've ever read on intermittent fasting is the idea of the clean fast. And the more I read, the more I learned, you know, after I read the obesity code, for example, in 2016, I realized mistakes I'd been making with fasting. Back when I first started, I started dabbling in it in 2009 and it never really stuck until 2014. And that's when I went on to lose, you know, the first 75 and then 80 pounds over time. And I was a dabbler. I didn't understand the science behind it all back then. 
And we also really thought it was just a way of cutting calories. You're eating less food. But after I read the obesity code, Dr. Jason Fung, I realized, oh, our bodies are a lot more complicated than calories in, calories out. Of course, that doesn't mean you can overeat and still lose weight. You can't. You, you can't eat more than your body needs, but it's not as simple as just count the calories, you will lose the weight. We've all had that fail for us over and over and over again. And so I realized that when you're fasting, you want to really be fasting. And Dr. Jason Fung taught me about insulin and how important it is to keep your insulin low if you want to tap into your fat stores, because insulin is antilipolytic, meaning that it prevents fat burning. So for all of us who have tried those low calorie diets where you eat frequently throughout the day, little tiny, small meals, all those food signals coming into your body keeps your body releasing insulin all day long. And your insulin stays up, 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 and you never really tap into your fat stores for fuel. And that's why you're hangry and you feel awful. But fasting is completely the opposite. Once you train your body to fast clean, you're keeping your insulin low during the fast, and then you're able to tap into your fat stores for fuel. You don't have those slumps. You're um, running on your stored fat for fuel. You have great energy. You have great mental clarity. It's a completely different experience. So keeping the fast clean is really the number one thing. And I think it's a non-negotiable. So I have all this in fast feast repeat, but there are three goals to the clean fast. One is keep your insulin low, like I just said, so you can tap into your fat stores. And we do that by making sure we don't send any food signals to the brain. We have something, something called the cephalic insulin response, where our brain, you know, from our taste buds, we get the message, oh, something with calories is coming in. And then our body releases insulin in response to that. And it can be something like a diet soda, which has no calories, but your brain doesn't understand because in all of the history of food and human life, if you had something sweet, it was because it was sugar or honey or fruit and your body knew a glucose glucose load was coming in. So it doesn't understand diet sodas. So also that would happen if you're drinking like a fruity herbal tea, like apple cinnamon delight or something, your brain's like, aha, we're having an apple dessert. It doesn't understand. So in order to keep our insulin low, we stick to plain water. We don't add fruit slices or make it delicious. <laughs> we stick to <laughs> black coffee with nothing added, plain tea, coffee and tea both have a bitter flavor profile. And that does not tell your brain we're going to need some insulin. So that's why coffee and tea black are okay. You stay away from the, un or stay away from the flavors. You don't want like hazelnut flavor or v vanilla delight. Stay away from all of those. Just keep it plain and black. So your brain doesn't think food's coming in. The second fasting goal is of course, that we want to burn our stored fat for fuel. So that is why we don't follow the, the fun trend of bulletproof coffee with putting butter and MCT oil and all that stuff in your coffee cup. Because when I'm doing intermittent fasting, I'd rather burn the fat from my body than fat from my coffee cup. Hmm. And so, you know, people are like, I love this bulletproof coffee. It gives me great energy. Well, of course it gives you great energy. It's a lot of energy in your coffee cup. <laughs> <laughs> so we don't want to take in sources of fuel. We want to use our own stored body fat for fuel. So don't put any fat, don't put cream, even a drop, don't put almond milk, all of that. Keep it out of your coffee. You just want it to be black and plain. And then the third fasting goal is we want to experience increased autophagy. Autophagy is our body's cellular recycling system where it goes in and cleans up all the old junky parts. And to do that, we want to keep from taking in protein during the fast. So you don't want to have like bone broth or something, you know, there's a popular bone broth fast, but bone broth is food for the body. It has plenty of protein. So it's not technically fasting. So avoid that. So you just stick to plain water, plain sparkling water, unflavored coffee, black, the same with tea. Don't add anything to it. And, and that's what you do during the fast. And really almost every other book you, you will read. In fact, I, I don't know of any that really insist that you stick to the clean fast other than me. But with all of my um, years of experience with real people, at one time, we had a combined membership of almost 500,000 members in my Facebook groups. The number of people who have said, gosh, I used to do such and such because I heard it was okay. I saw YouTube about it. It said it was fine if I put Stevia in. But then I read your book and I didn't want to believe you, but I tried it anyway. And oh my gosh, you were right. <laughs> so the number of people that have said, well, I thought, 
putting butter in my coffee was okay. And then I stopped doing it and oh my gosh, you were right. So that's why I came up with the clean fast challenge and fast feast repeat for anybody who doesn't think that I'm right. And it's okay to not think I'm right because you can find scientific articles that say there is no insulin response from diet soda, but you can also find scientific articles that say that there is. Mm. So if we're trying to keep our insulin low, you want to err on the side of caution. So I challenge everyone to try it my way, give it a month, six weeks, and you will not go back. Mm, absolutely. And yeah, it's so interesting for me, it was a final piece of the puzzle of why, why have I tried everything and nothing works? And I think for people listening, and I'm going to do a bit more of an introduction uh, before this, before this goes out, but it will, you know, the, the realization that you have the freedom not to eat during right. the day. And then obviously both you and I do a eating window and your whole point with delay, don't deny is uh, you delay your food. Don't deny yourself your meal in the evening, your delicious food. You love food, right? I, I love important. food. <laughs> <laughs> and no, some people are like, I couldn't do intermittent fasting. I love to eat so much. I'm like, that's why I do it. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> It's so I can have my delicious food right. in, my, in my window. And I, I don't have, have to deny myself from butter or yes. a cookie or a delicious food. <laughs> Exactly. So is your, I, I guess the reason you wrote, coming back to your writing and publishing, the reason you wrote Delay, Don't Deny was to help other people, but also to share your own experience right. and to talk about that. So your life was changed and you wanted to change other people's lives. I think that's a really good reason to write. So let's come back to the self-publishing. Okay. Obviously, you mentioned that um, that's the way you went the first time. And so what were the benefits of doing that? And what were some of the issues you mentioned? some of the technical stuff you had to learn, but what happened after it went out there? And then what happened with your publishing journey and how did you get that next deal? All right. Well, you know, the beauty of, of self-publishing is that I could write something now and have it for sale on Amazon this afternoon. Of course, that's also the downfall because <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> someone could write something now and have it on Amazon in the afternoon and it could be garbage. All the, the books that people write that are like, you know, where they try to steal the title of another book. Like right now there's one I have to get taken down because it's, they use my title in theirs and I have a trademark, but all the things I've learned along the way, but it's just, it frees you up to get it out quickly. The traditional publishing process is very long mm. and it has to go through so many hands. And honestly, things going through a lot of hands can get, it can actually create problems like with, um, with fast feast repeat, which I I published through St. Martin's press. They're delightful. I love my editor. I love everybody there, but somehow along the way from when I turned in my first draft till it, I was reading it for audible, a whole paragraph got changed and it, it made no sense. And I'm like, where'd this come from? I didn't notice it was there until I was reading it for audible. And I was making notes of things that needed to be fixed before it went to print and then I, I sent it to my editor. She's like, too late. It's already in line for printing. And I'm like, well, wait a minute. We still have, you know, like, what was this? Like April? We still had over two months before it was going to be officially for sale. She's like, yes, but we're in line at the printer and you can't make a change while you're in line at the printer. So the first 10,000 copies had a few mistakes in there that I knew were there. And we knew we were there. They were minimal. They weren't huge. And everybody listening, don't worry. If you buy a copy now, those it's first, first 10,000 is precious. <laughs> yeah. Those first ones are long gone. You won't. And it wasn't anything that, that was like going to make your fasting ruined. It was just like that one a sentence got changed and it didn't make sense. It wasn't the way I had originally written it. Mm -hmm. And they had forgotten to put, um, they, they left out flavored coffee in the chart. They add, have added it in since. So you'll get a copy that has the right information. But the amount of time, like I could pull Delayed on Deny right now, make a change to anything, and it would be seamless and be correctly out there this afternoon. It, it's just so quick. So with self-publishing, you're like, oh, I do remember the very first day, January 1, 2017, within a couple hours after people buying it. Somebody said, I found a typo in the introduction. <laughs> <laughs> but I was able to correct it and boom, it was fixed. So that's one of the, the perks of self-publishing. You also make a lot more per copy with self-publishing than you do from a traditional publisher, like a lot. But the flip side is with a tra traditional publisher, 
you get it out into more hands and it's, it's widely available. You can be on the New York Times bestseller list because they have sales data. There's so many pros and cons, but I think you asked about how did I make the transition to traditional publishing? And it's actually, I don't know if I I told you that, I don't think you know this story at all, but I had some trouble in 2018 with book pirating. Mm. Delay Don't Deny was selling very, very well. And turns out that makes you a really big (laughs) mark for pirates who copy the whole book and then they sell it through third-party sellers, but they're counterfeit. And so all of a sudden, my paperback sales went down dramatically, and I didn't know why. And I reached out to Amazon. I'm like, I know people are still buying it, but it says in my report that that zero people bought the paperback between this day and this day. And yet I see people in the groups every day. They're like, here's my book. I just got it. You know, what's happening? To make a long story short, we found there was a counterfeit version. It had typos on the back cover. It had a different font. The book was in a different font. It had italics in places. I didn't have them. The spacing was different. And Amazon worked with me, but I still I lost thousands of dollars over the course of that, those months before I figured out what was happening. And so it made me think, you know what? I have all my eggs in this one basket of Amazon because I'm self-published through Amazon. And and it was a real I had to really push for them taking my case seriously. Mm, yes. and and prove it and buy multiple copies of my books. And sometimes the counterfeiters still, you know, roll them out through third-party sellers, but the third-party sellers themselves don't always realize they've bought a bunch of counterfeit. So they've been great to work with me. I, I keep my eye on the listing. And it was because Amazon changed the rules in 2018 where third-party sellers could get the buy box. Yeah, yeah. Remember. And so mm. they, whoever has it for cheapest gets the buy box. And so that's how the, the pirates were able to pop in there and sell it. Um, to so many people before I realized what was happening. But I was like, I really need support. I, I don't want to do this all by myself. This is my whole livelihood. If something happens with my book, you know, I'm done. And so I found a great literary agent. I went to the publisher's marketplace and, you know, who are the top nonfiction agents in the the diet category? And because mm-hmm. I had sold so many copies of Delay Don't Deny that was self-published, the top three all wanted to work with me, which was so exciting. But again, it goes back to what I said at the beginning. In order to find an agent and a publisher, you have to have a track record. So you have to make your own track record these days. You can't Mm -hmm. just start off. No one would have looked at Delay Don't Deny. If I'd been like, I have a great idea for a book and I have a group of 3,000 people in it, they'd have been like, thank you, but no. (laughs) (laughs) Well, they wouldn't have replied. (laughs) No, that's true. No agent would have taken me on. No publishing house would have been willing to take a chance on this book. But suddenly I had all these sales and they're like, oh, you're interesting to us now. So you have to build your own platform and then people want to take a chance on you. So I found a literary agent. And then the first idea was to shop Delayed on Deny around and try to get it taken over by a traditional publishing house. But because of how much I was selling, Nobody had an offer that was high enough for me to say yes Mm. to. So I was like, yeah, "Yeah, I'm just going to keep it. I think really the best thing to do is to write a new book. And that's where Fast Feast Repeat was born. And, you know, I'm glad that I did it that way because Delay Don't Deny continues to sell even after Fast Feast Repeat came out. Yesterday, Fast Feast Repeat was number two in the weight loss category on Amazon, which is still very exciting because it came out last June. It's still doing very, very well. But Delay Don't Deny was number 25 in the weight loss category on Amazon. So it's still selling well. So I have my, my, you know, income stream from delay on deny that never went away. And then I have fast feast repeat as well. And I was able to, to find a great publishing house, St. Martin's. And when we were negotiating for the advance, I was like, I don't even care if you give me an advance, I'm going to sell so many of these books that <laughs> you're going to be sending me royalty checks. And they're like, well, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I and that actually is what happened. Yeah, well, so. I think that is more common with nonfiction anyway, is that you don't necessarily get a, a big advance, but you get really better royalties. And just, just to come back on the piracy, we should say that obviously traditionally published books get pirated all oh, the time. Oh, absolutely. But, but you've got but, a legal department protecting exactly. you, not just you going, this book is counterfeit. Yeah, Amazon exactly. doesn't want to talk to me. Mm. They're like, no, it's not. That. For, for months, they told me nothing was wrong. Yeah. <laughs> They're like, sorry, nothing's wrong. It's not a problem. No one's buying paperbacks anymore. I swear to God, someone said that to me. 
<laughs> people just aren't buying as many paperbacks. And the part that made me so angry is Amazon knew exactly how many they were selling. If they had just talked to the departments had talked to each other, they knew how many they sold and they know how many they paid me royalties for. And those numbers did not match. And they mm. could have very easily cross check, especially with their own in-house people. Yeah, definitely. And I know a lot of authors, ha- there are always pros and cons of every approach. <laughs> right. um, we, we have to deal with the, the cards we choose, but you've definitely got the best of both worlds because as yes. you say, you still have control of one, you can do sales easily and all of that and giveaways. And and also you get more sales with cross promotion. So and I don't do any sales or giveaways. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> there's there's no need because they they no. sell each other. But right. I wondered um, about book marketing because this is something that many authors struggle with. You know, there's writing the book and there's publishing it, but then there's marketing. So what is the split, I guess, or what is does the publishing house do for you, and what are you doing yourself? What drives the sales of the books? Do you think? I'm going to be honest with you. You know, they may talk a good game about what they're going to do for you. And again, I love my publisher. I love my editor. She's fabulous. They have a publicity department that's gotten me into a few publications. But honestly, the publisher expects you to market your book these days. They they don't send you on tour. They don't. <laughs> they're they're. I mean, they maybe they they might for some people, but. I asked about it. Like I had someone who wanted to put on an event for me in a, in a town. I was going to have to travel. I'm like, well, y'all, you know, this if this event is organized, will you pay? And they're like, nope, that's all on you. <laughs> so you've got to do it yourself. And of course, in this day and age with social media and podcasts, the barrier to entry is zero. I'm just learning how to how to do it. And so you just, you got, you have to build your audience. So there is no substitute for building your audience. That is where the magic lies. You know, you can write the best book in the world, but if nobody finds it and nobody reads it, it's not going to be a success. And I think that's what happens. If it is good and it gets out there, like delay, don't deny. I wrote a book that people enjoy reading and it helped a lot of people. So word of mouth, it just got bigger and bigger and bigger. I think that I read, I don't know if this is true, but I read a a blog post or saw it in a podcast somewhere. Maybe I read the transcript. 10,000 is the magic number. If you can sell 10,000 copies of your book, it's out there enough that it's going to keep selling steadily over time. So you want to get that that first 10,000 out there and get people to buy it. But you really have to build your audience. And I did that through Facebook groups and providing the support there on Facebook. And then my first podcast in 2017, and then a second podcast in 2018, that was when intermittent fasting stories came out. And just, you have to tell the story that, you know, that make people want to listen to you with intermittent fasting stories. You talked about, you enjoy hearing it. Mm. It's, it's me and a guest and we talk and people like to hear it. And so it keeps them coming back to listen again, but people like to, to hear real stories. They want to hear I mean, you could read all the science in the world, but if there's no real story connected to it, it's not going to feel like something you really care about. And I think for me, it was, I mean, I listened to the Intermittent Fasting Stories podcast before I bought any of your books. And right. I know sometimes you sound surprised on the show when people say that, like they found you through the podcast and then they read the book. And I Well, course- I'm no longer <laughs> surprised by it, but it, it actually for a while, you know, because I was just... It, but I, I'm used to it now, but it's taken yeah. me a while to get there. But I think it's, there's a trust. So people, obviously I'm introducing you to my audience and, and I'm coming on your show. So right. it's the same thing. So people get to trust the host. And if I say that I want to talk to you because I trust you, then that just gives uh, a lot more I guess, clout to the audience and they go, okay, well, I trust this person because I've been listening to them for years right? and therefore I'm open to the guest. And in the same way, I feel like when I was listening to you on your show, then I was like, oh, okay, I really like her. Uh, I'm going to check out her book. And so I think this is how podcasting can sell books, but it's not necessarily a one click thing, you know? Correct. Correct. You're, I agree with you completely. And people have to first connect with you and mm. then they want to read what you've got. And there's some people I'll read everything they write, no matter what they write, I'm going to read it. And mm. I think that's true for, but that's your small fan base. You've got your small fan base of people that'll read anything you write, but then it's got to be good to keep selling. 
you've got to write a good book that people will recommend to other people. Because if only my fan base for intermittent fasting stories had read my book, then it would have been, you, know, you see it happen a lot. Like I watched the, the Amazon bestseller list in the weight loss category and a new book pops up every time it comes out, it pops up. It'll be number one, number two, you know, the number one, will be like the paperback. Number two will be the Kindle version. Number three might be the audible version. So it holds that position for a while. And then you see it goes away. It falls away, but to stay, you know, up there becoming a New York times bestseller or having a bestseller is one thing, but continuing to sell your books to people over time is is more of a challenge. And that's where the book, like I said, it has to be good. The book has to be one that can stand the test of time and have people recommend it to other people. Mm. Well, then let me ask you about the challenge of a niche. So right. you have a, have a niche, which is I do. Int- intermittent fasting, and you've got the three books and the workbooks, I think, at the moment. And you've, as you said, you're working on another one. So it must be very challenging to come up with more books on the same topic. So well, I'm not doing that. Do- ah, okay. I'm not writing Tell another book it. on the same topic. <laughs> and see, that's the thing where I'm a little bit contrary and breaking the mold because my editor, of course, and the whole publishing house is very interested in, okay, so you've written this great book, Fast Feast Repeat, New York Times bestseller. What's your next fasting book going to be? <laughs> and I'm like, no, there isn't going to be a next fasting book because I wrote the book about intermittent fasting that said everything I need to say. I don't need to write a book about one meal a day, intermittent fasting. I don't need to write a book. It's all, all in Fast Feast Repeat. I put it all there and that's it. And so I don't want to be one of those authors that writes the same book over and over and over. And then just you're on that cycle of book, 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 book. And then I don't need people to read another intermittent fasting book that I wrote. Now, Delay Don't Deny stands the test of time because it is always going to appeal. There, some people will prefer Delay Don't Deny and some people will prefer Fast Feast Repeat. It just all depends on how deep you want to go. Mm. And some people will want to read both because there is you know, a difference to the two. You'll get different things out of Delay, Don't Deny than you got out of Fast Feast Repeat. So I, I didn't rewrite Delay, Don't Deny and release it as Fast Feast Repeat. It's a completely updated book with, with a lot more detail and section on food and the feast section. It's a great book. And Feast Without Fear, my second book, was also self-published, but it is not an intermittent fasting book. It's a book about choosing foods that work well for your body, the idea of personalized nutrition, your gut microbiome, all of that, um, you know, eating according to your DNA. So it's a completely different book. So the work, the book I'm working on now is not an intermittent fasting book. And it's about what you eat and how you live. I don't want to get into too many details yeah, yeah. about it. Yeah. <laughs> but it's more but like a lifestyle book. Or not a- necessarily. It's about it's about cleaning up where it counts. Let me put mm. it that way. Cleaning up your life with food and with um, but it's still a self-help how you live. It, oh, yes. Book. It absolutely mm. is a self-help slash health book. That was mm. a tongue twister. Self-help yeah. <laughs> slash health. Yes, it very much is. And then I actually have a, a, a two book deal. So I'm going to write another one the next year. And we haven't decided on what that one will be yet, but I I have a very strong idea about what I want it to be. And I've just got to talk them into it. That's the other difference about being with a traditional publisher. You're like, I know that people will love this and I know they will want it. And they're like, no, I don't like that one. I'm like, I promise you this one's going to be the bestseller. I promise you, let me write it. Let me write it. Let me write it. And they're like, "Uh uh-uh, no. (laughs) We know you always have another choice. (laughs) Well, well, you know, I want, I, I really want to keep working with them and with my editor, but they do have first right of refusal, but if they refuse, then, you know, I'm not locked to them. I can still do what I want to do. But anyway, I do have an idea for my next one that's coming in a year. So I hope I can. Oh, well, that's great. Get I like them that. to and go along. Yeah, it's kind of tangential. I think that's exactly the right way to do it. And of course, I write books for authors under Joanna Penn, and they all cover smaller areas of, of the author life. So it, that c- it completely makes sense to me. But I did I did also want to come back on uh, Facebook, because of course, at right? the beginning, you talked about in 2016, you started out with Facebook groups, and you built up your audience to over 500,000 people. But in March 2021, you wrote a, a blog blog post about why you quit Facebook. I quit Facebook. I know. This is huge. So tell us about that. Well, it's, it really, um, here's, here's what's funny back in the fall of 2020, my agent said, you know, you again, like all my eggs in the Amazon basket, she said, you've got all your eggs in the Facebook basket. If something were to ever happen on Facebook, 
you would lose your whole audience. You need to start collecting their email addresses. I'm like, oh no, nothing's ever going to happen. This is how it works for me. This is my group. This is what I do. I don't need to worry. Well, then in the fall, I read an article about how Facebook was quote cracking down on health groups mm, yeah. and no longer recommending them. And because a lot of people would find my groups because it would show up in the groups you might like category. And that, you know, struck fear in my heart. I'm like, wait, Facebook could literally decide we don't support intermittent fasting. We think it's wacky, no more intermittent fasting. And then we'd all go dark. And so I started really thinking about that. And they actually did that within the essential oil community. A lot of people in the essential oil community found their groups just were closed. Mm -hmm. You know, and of course, once you start, you, you make this decision, stories come out of the woodwork. A friend of mine shared a story of another friend who had a cooking group. It was just a cooking group with 10,000 members. And she went to bed one night with a cooking group and woke up the next morning. And not only was the cooking group removed, but she was blocked from Facebook because something that happened overnight while she was sleeping went against something or other oh, and Facebook shut it down. And she wasn't even awake, didn't even know what happened, but it just lets you know that you're very much guests on Facebook's platform. And, and so then I started thinking about that and I'm like, I need to have a platform that's just for me and my audience that I control. And I'm not really at the whim of artificial intelligence flagging what you're writing. Like, for example, one of our moderators wrote a very great skilled reply to somebody about becoming fat adapted, which is part of the lingo. You become fat adapted. That means your body can tap into your fat stores. And she said something like, once you're fat adapted, the fast becomes much easier. Well, the artificial intelligence on Facebook flagged that as hate speech and bullying Oh, okay. because of the words you're fat. Oh, <laughs> but in context, when you're yeah. fat adapted, it makes perfect sense. It's totally not hate speech or bullying, but she got flagged and we got dinged because she's a moderator. And Facebook said, if your moderators or admin are using, you know, going against community standards, we can shut your group down. We're getting these notices behind the scenes and that's scary. So we're trying to figure out how do you say once you're lipid adapted, I mean, <laughs> you're having to be really careful because you'd get in Facebook jail. She wasn't able to post on Facebook for seven days. Yeah. Facebook jail is a term. She, now. <laughs> it's a thing. She was in Facebook jail. And so all that fear, like I said, led me to start my own platform, the DDD social network at ddsocialnetwork.com. It's a membership site and people can pay to join. But once I started setting that up, it made me take a hard look at what I was doing and how I was spending my day. And I had been thinking about this for years because when I wrote Fast Feast Repeat, it came out in 2020, but I was writing it in 2019. And I purposefully did not say the word Facebook in Fast Feast Repeat one time. In fact, my editor was like, do you want to add your Facebook groups to your bio? I'm like, no, because <laughs> I knew that it was unsustainable. I could not personally manage 500,000 people in Facebook groups. It, it was like, you know, I woke up in the morning and it was the first thing I did. I, I basically, it, it was affecting the quality of my life to the point that it was all I had time to do. I just spent the weekend away with my sister and it's the first time we'd been anywhere since I left Facebook. And she's like, this is night and day. You're present. You're here. You're able to sit at the dinner table. And I just cannot express how intrusive Facebook had become in my life. Mm. And so making the shift, I, I would say 99% of the response has been positive. Although this morning I woke up to a message for, you know, the moderators are still running the, the main delay don't deny intermittent fasting support group. We have uh, ask a moderator post every day. Members can't post, but they can ask questions and the moderators will still support them even though I'm not there. But so we have a chat that we, we talk about group business and I'm still there providing administrative advice. But she said, if someone is in a spinoff group and they're slamming Jen and talking really bad about Jen, can we remove them from this group? I'm like, you know, so people are still out there. They're mad. They're mad that I closed down um, two of my groups, the advanced group that had just over 30,000 members and the one meal a day group that had just about 100,000 members. Um, the regular group, we didn't change how that functions at all, except that I'm not there, like mm. I said, but the advanced group is closed and the, the one meal a day group. But those were the ones where I was spending so much time because the members were posting. And so you had to be there moderating. People really enjoyed being in the groups, but the reason they enjoyed them is because of how heavily moderated their work they were and how much time we spent behind the scenes, making sure everyone was kind and not bullying and giving good advice and not saying, oh, I drink bulletproof coffee and it's fine. We didn't want to have conflicting advice. And it took 
so much time to manage it. And so when I wrote that blog post, my husband said, you're going to regret it. I'm like, well, if I regret it, I regret it, but I will not regret living my life on my terms. And so when it dropped, I woke up that morning and archived the two groups and waited to see what would happen. And (laughs) when I write a blog post, I don't get very many comments. That first two, the first two days, 80 people submitted comments for my blog post and they were overwhelmingly positive. Mm. And it just made me feel so relieved that people understood. They're like, I can't believe you did it as long as you did. I often saw, I was like, she's up at 5, 15 in the morning responding. And here she is at 10 o'clock at night responding. When does Jen sleep? And so people get it. They understood that, that I couldn't continue to provide free intermittent fasting support for the world forever. Yeah. You know, and, and, but the part on the flip side of that, the people who were angry somehow felt that buying my book for 1495 entitled them to me forever for free. And I'm like, 1495 for a book entitles you to a book, not support from <laughs> yes, the author. Absolutely. <laughs> you know, and, and so I was happy to do it. I was really happy to do it. I loved building that community, but it just became unsustainable for me. I love that. And I think it comes out. It's also this pandemic time has really helped us all consider what do I really want in my life? That's true. Yeah. And it's like, well, do I want to spend my time doing that? And you said no, and that's not what you want to do. And I completely right. agree with you. Like you, you wrote the book with all the answers. Uh, several I did. Books with lots of answers. So, lots of answers. <laughs> so people can go there. And I think it's very empowering that you've done that. And I think one of the, the things you've talked about in this is, is how empowering the choice is, the choice to self-publish, the choice to traditionally publish, the choice to build the groups and to to shut them down. That's the important thing, which is brilliant. So we're out of time. Where can people find you and your books and your podcasts online? Well, if you go to jenstevens.com, Jen is G-I-N, Stevens with a P-H. I have links to everything there. You can still join the Delay, Don't Deny Intermittent Fasting Support Facebook group and the moderators will answer your questions in the Ask a Moderator thread. But then we want you to join the the Delay, Don't Deny social network if you want to make posts and have a higher level of support. I'm having so much fun there because it's so different. I don't have to approve posts. And because people are paying, I mean, it's not expensive. It's $59 a year to Mm. join, which is like $4.99 a month. I mean, it's not expensive. It's like one latte a month to join. But that that tiny barrier of entry of $4.99 a month means that the people who are there really want to be there. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, so I am enjoy it's refreshing. We haven't had a single reported post or problem yet. <laughs> it's amazing. <laughs> yes. Well, I'd say yet, because eventually there'll be something. People are people. Yeah. But it's it's an amazing supportive community. And I have a 20, we have all these groups within it that people can join. I have a 28-day fast start group for new intermittent fasters. And I am personally responding to every post there. Someone posts about they're on day nine and, and, you know, I'm able to go in and it's not from 5.15 in the morning until 10.15 at night because it's smaller. I can go in one time in the morning, then I can go about my day, then I can go back in the evening and, and still provide support, but not have to micromanage behind the scenes every little thing that's happening. So it's, I'm loving it. And also my podcast, Intermittent Fasting Stories, you can find that anywhere you find podcasts. If you join the Delay Don't Deny social network, however, you can stream all episodes of Intermittent Fasting Stories ad-free. Ah, fantastic. No ads at all. You just stream them and you can um, ask. They come out on Thursday, but I'm putting them up on Monday so people can get them a few days early and no ads. So we are completely ad-free on the DDD social network. Brilliant. Well, thanks so much for your time, Jen. That was great. Well, thank you. So I hope you found the interview with Jen interesting and I highly recommend her books. Uh, Fast Feast Repeat is the one I particularly enjoy. And the one she hinted at is up for pre-order now. It's called Clean-ish. So you can check that out. And also I recommend the Intermittent Fasting Stories podcast, which is just one of Jen's many shows now. And I will be on there either next week as this goes out or sometime soon on intermittent fasting stories talking about my own experience of intermittent fasting. Uh, But I definitely enjoy that podcast because I like to hear all the different things that people have and the different health journeys people have. I find it 
super interesting. So whatever your health issues, I bet you there's an episode uh, on it that will help you. So next week, I'm talking to Scottish author Ed James about writing crime novels. So back to craft. So happy writing and I'll see you next time. Thanks for listening today. I hope you found it helpful. You might also like the backlist episodes and show notes available at thecreativepen.com forward slash podcast. You can also get your free author blueprint at thecreativepen.com forward slash blueprint. If you'd like to connect, you can tweet me at The Creative Pen or find me on Facebook at The Creative Pen. See you next time. <laughs>